Hello and welcome back to the PPW podcast, as always, bringing you news, views and interviews from the world of real estate, online marketplaces and prop tech industries. My name is Harvey Hancock. I'm news editor at onlinemarketplaces.com. I'll be your host today. And as always, we are with Simon Baker. Simon, how are you doing? (laughs) I'm doing very well. Early start to the day, but uh, happy to be chatting with uh, you and Joe. Perfect. And Joe, joining us all the way from Melbourne. How are you, my my, my friend? Good, good. It's a sunny day in Melbourne for for winter, which is quite a surprise given it's four o'clock in the afternoon or four thirty. So, doing very well this time of year. Thank you. Uh, see, I am in Cardiff, and it is notorious for its awful weather, and it's just started tipping down within five minutes of me waking up. So, uh, maybe it's England. Yes. Yeah, true. Don't I mean, say anything more. Let's move why on. Do you, why do you think I left? Hey, why do you think I left? <laughs> So uh, first things first, a little bit of a debrief. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for listening. We've been on a bit of a summer holidays hiatus, um, so we've been putting out uh, maybe fewer episodes than we would have ideally liked, but people are on their summer holidays, and it's we've got to enjoy the sun while we can, especially when you're in bloody Cardiff. (laughs) So um, right then. Uh, Simon, we're about six weeks out from Barcelona. Any updates? How are ticket capacities doing? Give us very well. We have um, about 250 already registered. We should hit 350, I think, for the conference, making it uh, probably our, our largest um, ever conference. Uh, the theme for anyone who is interested in coming along is um, AI and prop tech. What does the future hold? Very, very important uh, subject. And we've got about uh, 30 speakers already lined up, all with um, amazing insights into you know, about AI and how it really has the potential to change the way we we uh, engage with technology around property. So I hope people can come. If you want more information, go to www.ppweurope24.com. That's ppweurope24.com. Find out more information. And uh, we hope to see you there on the 2nd to the 4th of October in Barcelona. Now, don't forget that PropTech Startup Day, Simon, on the 1st. Can you give us any information about that? Yeah, sure. So the day before, we actually run a Startup Day for um, earlier stage businesses. In fact, Joe was involved in the one we had in uh, Barcelona. And what we do is we spend a complete day going from uh, the, the how do you think about a startup? How do you grow the business? How do you scale? How do you find the right um investors for the business and then how do you exit yeah legitimately exit one of these businesses so it's a complete very in-depth detailed interactive workshop and you'll have um about 50 or 60 participants and we you know have a panel of about six to seven industry experts people who have been through that entrepreneurial journey people who have built businesses sold businesses and have a lot of real interesting and exciting um, uh, experiences to share. I mean, it's uh, that brings us nicely onto today's topic, right? Because we are going to be talking about scaling and exiting. A little bit of context before we introduce Joe and, and hand over to him and his expertise. We were speaking with Mike Plichter um, from PropTech Farm a few weeks ago. And one of the very interesting things he said Uh, For those who haven't had time to listen to the episode yet, is that one of the three biggest reasons he noticed that startups fail is because the founder doesn't have the right skill set or the right mentorship to scale and exit his business, right? So we thought we'd talk to someone who's done exactly that, which brings us to today's episode topic, scaling and exiting, and which brings us to Joe Hanna, who is from Fusion 4 Ventures. Um, Joe, welcome to the show. Great to have you along. Could you give us a little bit of a context about, you know, what you've done in the industry, your experience, and specifically maybe what you've done in terms of scaling and exiting in the past? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Having hello everybody out there in the ether. Um, so a very quick overview for me personally. I started my life as a software engineer here in Australia. I've spent many years working at Fairfax Media, which most people will know as the domain group now, so the original owners of the number two portal here in Australia, and then left in around 2008. Uh, And then since then, I've been working closely with Simon and Gonzalo, uh, two other founding members of Future 4 Ventures, um, starting 
growing, investing in, IPOing, exiting uh, prop tech businesses all around the world. Probably two of the, that are most noteworthy of, of, of you know, in, in terms of this co- topic of conversation would be the Machula Group, uh, which many of you would know was started by Gonzalo, uh, the two Gonzalos and Marcelo back in, um, in 2010 in Madrid in Spain. We, Simon and I got involved in that business in about 2010, if memory serves Simon, and at that point as really investors and active kind of um, executives, if you like, helping roll out that product throughout Southeast Asia. And what we found in a business like that, that scalability was all around launching new countries, getting your know, market adoption, you know, getting through this kind of space approach of getting a presence, getting traffic, and then converting that traffic to monetization. And in the same way that Indeed.com, you know, had this kind of takeover the world strategy, it was a similar type of philosophy. When I mention the story these days, I kind of liken it to Travago or Kayak. You know, there's things that have happened quite, quite um, sophisticated um, aggregators within the hotel and, and leisure industry. Um, what was interesting about that business is we IPO'd on the Australian Stock Exchange in 2015, our first ever Spanish headquartered, headquartered business to IPO on the Stock Exchange. And we raised a little bit of money and continued to accelerate growth adding M&A to that, to that growth trajectory. And then obviously, as most people would know, uh, sold that business to Lifeful uh, to form Lifeful Connect in 2019. Uh, the next major kind of venture that's relevant here was the formation of what we call PropTech Group in Australia, which was the most recent uh, uh, venture of, uh, of mine. And, and really what that was focused on was an Australian-centric PropTech play, where we know that realestate.com and domain have a stronghold on the consumer experience in finding traffic, uh, but they don't really have a hold of what happens once you click the Inquire Now button. And really, that's where mission-critical software for agencies. And, and Australia is quite a sophisticated, mature market when it comes to real estate. So one thing that we thought, an angle we thought would, would really make sense is to own that agent experience, own the workflow solutions, the critical tools that they use all day, every day, and ensure that the consumer journey is as simple and automated as, as it can be. So PropTech Group was essentially a CRM system at its core, um, which was probably a bad way to describe what the, what the system actually did. It was more like an ERP back office system. Now we did that as a corporate carve out. And when I was at Domain, around the same time that, that Simon had the same idea at realestate.com, we bought a CRM at Domain. We really did that to get a better appreciation of what Australian real estate agents were spending their time on how they're spending their how they were spending their days, and more importantly, where they were spending their advertising dollars. Um, so part of PropTech Group was essentially a corporate carve out of this old CRM out of domain, replacing it with a new version, and really putting it together and scaling fast. In that context, scaling was all about relative market share, getting as many customers as we could that used that one core product, ensure that we dominated on that one core product, almost a land and expand strategy if I want to simplify it. And then once we hit market saturation or a point where we felt market saturation was, was approaching, we started to add additional products and services. Uh, beyond that, uh, Future 4 Ventures, which I'm sure we'll come to later, is, 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 is the focus for me now. And a lot of it is taking the learnings of scalability, scaling to exit from the um, learnings we've had in the past and applying that to, to other companies all around the world in prop tech, clearly. Joe, just to give... Um the listeners a bit of idea of scale. The Machula Group was literally started with you know, a few thousand euros, uh, grew, we listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and then eventually sold to Lifeline Japan for how much? Uh, around 180 million Aussie dollars. Uh, so call it 120 odd euros. Okay, and then uh, if you look at the PropTech Group, which was sort of formed in 2019 ish 2020 officially uh PropTech was officially officially formed in 2020 uh we raised 10 million dollars um uh, through a reverse takeover of an existing asset we had on the asx and a market cap of 30 million back then and then that was eventually sold to mri for how much 94 94 odd million within two right. actually less than two years later almost to the day two years later Okay, so 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 both of them were very successful examples of scaling and exiting, where you know, and, and I think PropTech Group is a very good a good example of where you bolted together uh, my desktop, Vault, Eagle, uh, a few other bits and pieces, 
to to take fundamentally 10 to 20 million dollars worth of value and convert it to 90 million dollars within a three-year period great okay so i think i think that's sort of a, a, sort of an important starting point here when when you think of um you know and, and and part of what we're doing with fusion four ventures is working with and we've got a good half dozen clients at the moment who we're you know we're working with and 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 the key issue seems to be very similar for all of them which is a we've got a good business it's functioning well but it's a little subscale and by subscale it doesn't mean it's not profitable it just means that it's hard to sell because of the size of the business how how do you think about um what subscale versus being at scale is and how do you think about getting there it's a, it's a good question i think we we, we often get asked you know scale what what does scale actually mean and, and i think it can mean different things to different companies in, in different regions you know for instance if i if i take the example of proptech group for us scale was all about relative market share you know it was less around the dollars and cents in the first instance it was about how do we ensure that our product offering which we believe to be the best is actually the best and is getting the, the most market share so when we take that context and, and apply it to a prop tech operating in, in any market anywhere in the world scale could be one of three things uh, customers <laughs> money products uh, and for nine times out of ten it's mostly product penetration so ultimately, a lot of the prop techs are, are based on a single product offering or, or a core competency, if you like. And scale usually means how do you get that in the hands of more, more people to validate whether you actually have um, the leading product, whether you have something unique. So scalability is often around building a moat, around defensibility, around your, your current position. Uh, in some instances where you mentioned um, they have subscale, it could be about um, having a mature business that now needs to double down on revenue generation where you've, you've, you've hit the correct scale in terms of number of customers, uh, the adoption rate's really high, but you're really not charging the right amount. So scale is price elasticity. Um, in, in other instances, it's about extracting more of a share of wallet from those existing customers. So less around trying to grow the amount of customers and more around growing the products that complement that core offering. So it's really dependent on where a, a, a product or service is within its given lifestyle. Nine times out of 10, as I mentioned, it's really about doubling down on what you're really good at and doing more of that. What we find particularly in smaller markets, and I, and I use Australia a lot, obviously being Australian, it's a very small market. So we find here, scale in Australia often means, oh gee, I need to make more money, therefore I'll add other products and services to my core product, which I won't be the best at, but may be able to extract more dollars from it. And that's often a bad thing to do. It's often better to be laser focused on what you do really well, look internationally, uh, and obviously PropTech is very similar in many markets around the world, uh, and focus on that core offering. So scalability in that instance is around internationalization. Resist the urge to try to make more money through you know, less competitive third-party products or additional products. Uh, and really extract the most amount of value out of your core offering. Uh, in Fusion 4, we're seeing some examples of that already in some of our early clients where there's a tendency to try to just bundle on more things because you've got a good relationship with an existing client rather than double down on continuing that you know, go-to-market strategy, or banging on doors, getting your BDMs, you know, smashing down leads and trying to grow organically uh, the number of customers you have. The, the, the second part angle to scale is, you know, sometimes scaling is about acquisitive scale. You know, sometimes buying your competitor actually makes a lot of sense. Buying the number three player makes a lot of sense. So scale is about, in my, in my mind, that the simplest way of, of, of wrapping it up is relative market share around your competitors for your core offering. How do you build a moat and a defensible moat around your core offering? Yeah, and the interesting thing about scale is scale is is intimately tied to exit, and it's tied to exit because the larger you are, the more attractive you become to an acquirer. Uh, and and what's interesting is and and for those unaware, Fusion Four Ventures operates uh, globally. We have clients in Latin America, Europe, um, Asia, and Australia. So we sort of you know we're market agnostic. Um, but what, what's interesting is they all face a very similar issue is that I've got to get, I want, I really want to sell my business. 
I've been in this business for maybe 10 years, 15 years. I was chatting to someone yesterday, um, a potential uh, client, and, and, and they've, they've been 20 years in the business. And they've built a, a nice business. It's doing three to four million in revenues. It's sort of making a little bit of money. But it's, it's hard to get to that point where it's, it's super attractive to a buyer. And, and my advice to them was, well, don't think about selling now thinking about scaling and preparing for sale, which means be super focused, as you were talking about, on, on what you're really good at. Demonstrate that you can grow at, a, at say, a 20 to 30% per annum rate. Move into profitability or demonstrate that you can be profitable. And then let's find you know, the best fit for your business, the best new home for the business where you're you're adding. So how do you think about scale connected to exit? It's a, re- it's a really good distinction. I think, um, and if I digress for a moment, going back to what Harvey mentioned, Mike mentioned about some of the founders' challenges with founders and scalability is you know, getting a business from zero to a million dollars takes a certain amount of effort. Getting it from a million to 10 million, if I use round numbers, takes a, a different type of effort. Typically, the founders are, are fairly good to get to, to that $10 million stage. Growing business from 10 to 100 is a total different set of skills. And, and often the founders uh, who get really good at getting from zero to 10 aren't necessarily the right people to get it from 10 to 100. Now, that, taking that context into scaling to exit, the definition of exit needs to be defined first, first and foremost. Well, what is an exit for the, for, for the purpose of this particular startup? For this the imaginary startup we're using for explanatory purposes, an exit is a true selling to a third party, uh, a, a strategic competitor, so let's say it's a trade sale, uh, as opposed to an exit being an IPO or an exit being the next round and, 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 the, and the founder maybe taking a step back. So it, it, where, where the, the true exit is selling to a third party, then ultimately scale is about doing the hard work for them now, is getting as many customers as you can extracting the most amount of value from those customers or growing them in a way that they are long-term customers, your net retention rate is high, your churn's really low, and then enabling a third party, a trade sale, a strategic buyer to come in and enjoy the fruits of that labor by extracting costs. So you're ultimately positioning yourself in a way that is, hey, we've we've grown significantly. Um, We've been growing profitably in an ideal world, but we haven't focused on the bottom line. We've focused on ensuring that we're kind of break even or cost neutral and growing as fast as we can. That that then makes it a really attractive opportunity for someone to come in that has a lot of the back office services that sees significant cost synergies and makes it a no-brainer to say, well, if I strip out costs, I can run this business at a 30%, 40% margin. Gee, that flows straight, straight through the bottom line. And that's before you even start looking at possible revenue synergies. So scaling to exit, as I think you, you termed it really well, Simon, it's about being the best at what you do and accelerating at what you do. Putting the foot down and saying, I, I know that if I was going to own this business for the next 10 years, then profitability, paying a dividend would be really important. But if I want to sell it in the next two or three years, I need to ensure that I can demonstrate acceleration of growth through a number of customers, not necessarily a number of products, but a number of customers using my core product. Okay, so so let's explore what people do wrong. Okay, what what would you think are the top three things that a founder or CEO would or board, I guess, as from guidership perspective, leadership perspective, would do wrong from scaling perspective and from a exit perspective? Good question. I, I think first of all. You, you get, I find, and, and I'm interested in your view, there's two sides, two spectrums here. There are those that think a lot about the exit um, and work back from an exit. Uh, and then there are those that don't think at all about an exit and, and just kind of think about the next year or the next two years. Uh, and, and if you're thinking about an exit working back, um, that can often be good, but sometimes mislead you. And there's there's kind of pros and cons of both. So... I think the first challenge that, that boards and founders typically uh, tend to make is focusing on the short term, not having a strategic plan, a three to five year plan over where they'd like the business to be, and then using that to inform decisions of today. The biggest mistake I think people make is adding additional products and services 
because they've got a good relationship with a court with with a set of customers um, and think they can extract more value from that. Again, if your view is to have a profitable business that pays good dividends, that's okay. If your view is to scale to exit, that's bad because nine times out of 10, the additional products and services you're, you're offering aren't best in breed and your likely acquirers probably already have those services because they're complementary. So the number one kind of um, failure, I guess, is sticking to a strategy which is all about growing your core customer base for your core customer offering. Uh, and, and extracting as much value from that core product as you can. So that could be increasing price. Uh, it could be holding back price increases to grow relative market share until you feel like you've hit it, hit the maximum kind of the peak, and then start extracting value from 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 price. Uh, the second is thinking about when where the right time is to exit, and we're seeing a lot of this in Fusion Four now, where. Uh, the light bulb moment's gone off. I've, I've had an R4. The business feels like it's in the right place. I now want to exit. And then when you start to look at the key metrics or look at it through the lens of a potential acquirer, you realize that there are some core things that need to happen and probably a year or two prep work that needs to go in in order to get sellable or you know a, a, a acquirable ready. And, and I, I think that's another key outcome that, that particularly boards need to start th thinking through. Selling a business is a long journey and requires forethought and fore planning. So, you know, we would often recommend if the idea is to sell or the intention is to sell, start thinking about it, planning for it, and start working towards the metrics that you know you need to achieve in order to make this business sellable within a period of time. I think another another mistake companies make when they're thinking about exit is pricing. Um, you know, recently someone I've been chatting to, you know, they were looking to sell their business and they didn't really know what it was worth. And so they they approached someone and they 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 just basically looked at um you know some multiples in the market, typically, you know, right move or whatever, right? And they start to apply it to themselves and they instantaneously price themselves out of the market in that conversation. And I think one of the challenges is if you're a, a, a small to medium sized business you are maybe not um uh, as focused on your business as as you know so your products aren't as focused as you were talking about before and you may not be sale ready you know your systems and processes your kpis your tracking your reporting and so on is maybe less rigid as it should be or less less um process driven as it should be then you've got to understand that you're going to have to take a discount for uh, for the, for the value of your business because you've got to make it you know look pretty good and and what 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 for you makes a saleable business what are the sort of metrics at, at a macro level that that people are looking for absolutely so let, let me address the, the first point around valuation i think it's it, it, that's a one that, that I probably take as a given, but most most people don't. I mean, even if we look at PropTech Group, um, that was growing at sixty uh, percent year on year on average, two years in a row. We more than doubled revenue um, for the first year. We we're on track to double it again uh, for the second and third year. We sold that business at five times ARR, which by by private market uh, and any comps is very cheap. Um, but in reality, that was the that was the top end of the conversations we were having when you're looking to sell a business. So getting really realistic over valuations, I think, is, is critically important because it is an exit, uh, and an exit is different to uh, a capital raise where that you could you know, convince a shareholder or an incoming investor that the the sky is the limit. This is this is the end of the journey for most shareholders and the start for the incoming investor. In terms of the key metrics, it's all around continued growth. You Have you reached your the top of your peak in terms of market penetration? What value can I do you bring to my suite of products? And typically, investors or acquirers will look at two main things. One is cost synergies. Uh, what, what cost can I strip out of this business? And, and, and a key part of that is key person risk. So a lot of founders... Um, that are really important and still an important part of businesses think now's the time to sell, but then you know quickly come to realize that without me involved in this business, it looks very different uh, and may not work as well. So you're reducing that key person risk and ensuring that the company can stand on its own two feet, that, that um, whoever's acquiring the business is not acquiring uh, a, a need to have these key people risk or at least have 
uh, Ernest and some of those kind of discussions already prepared so that key people know that they'll be uh, involved in the business doing, moving forward. Uh, the second is the growth rate. What has the growth been in, in, in over the last few years and how sustainable is that? Again, remembering what I mentioned about key purchase risk. Now, it doesn't always need to be a continued ability to grow. Again, I'll use PropTech Group as an example. We sold that business off the back of the cost savings for MRI. We knew and they knew that they weren't going to continue to grow anywhere near at the rates that we were going to grow at. But they, we also knew that they could strip out a lot of costs and they could run a business where we were effectively running a break even at about a 45% EBITDA margin. So for them, that was very attractive. So it's understanding what appeals to the acquirer and ensuring that your metrics um, you know, follow suit. So either continued growth where the acquirer is on their continued growth journey and sees this opportunity to grow revenues fast, complementary products and services, or an EBITDA margin multiple or an EBITDA kind of cash cow, if you like, stripping out costs and ensuring that the acquirer can enjoy the fruits of the labour over the last few years of that accelerated growth. When you um, think about helping companies through this process, what, what sort of role does Fusion 4 Ventures play? It's a good question, and, and I think we're finding as, as, we, as we work with more companies that kind of morphs into uh, what's needed for a specific company. And in some instances, it's a very hands-on, you know, almost executive-like role. Uh, but in many instances, it, it's an it's advisory board. It's really kind of getting a deep appreciation. You know, when, you, when you're heavily involved in the weeds of your company, sometimes having a bird's-eye view, an external view, laying out the land of what the current situation actually is, uh, is the first thing that we, we, we tend to do. Here's what reality is from an outside in point of view, just to let's all get aligned on that. So our role tends to, to evolve from really high level kind of birds of a you strategic advisory into, well, if I was you know, your CPO or your, C, your chief strategy officer trying to sell the business from within, what would we need to do in order to, to make that happen? Um, so, you know, it's a very hands-on, very kind of immersive you know, uh, role that we tend to play in order to extract that view of what the company needs to achieve to be sellable. Uh, and in some instances, companies are ready, ready to sell. It's just about how, how to pitch it, how to uh, explain the right metrics, how to pull together a, an IM and run a process. But in many instances, it's around planning ahead for the next 12 months, 18 months, 24 months to that saleability event. Um, the other part that we do is obviously connect. I mean, we, we, we're, we're, we've got a lot of connections globally and can join dots uh, that otherwise would be hard to join if you were kind of in the weeds of your day-to-day -day business. Okay, and, and in terms of exit, what, what sort of role does Fusion 4 Ventures play there? How do you help companies go through this exit process? Yeah, as, as much as I don't want to say this, it's, it's almost like an investment backers role. I mean, we, we will drive the process, we will run the process of picking the potential acquirers, preparing the due diligence material, uh, preparing the IEM and actually connecting potential acquirers through. So we'll actually take the advisory role on and, and connect uh, potential acquirers with the company and help negotiate uh, the, 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 the exit for those companies. So in many instances, whilst we don't pitch ourselves uh, as a corporate advisory, we are competing in that kind of last mile uh, process running of actually executing on, on the exit. And, and I guess the most important question is how do you get paid? Well, this is the other positive thing. Given that we're all kind of seasoned entrepreneurs, seasoned investors, we have a flexible um, kind of mandate and, and payment scheme. So many it's success-based, often always success-based with small retainer. In some instances, it's cash. In other instances, it's shares. You know, it really depends on where the company is in their evolution. Uh, I don't think we would ever take a job on that we didn't believe uh, in ourselves that we'd be prepared to take script or success. So, for, you know, nine times out of ten, it's around we believe in, in the company, we believe in the vision, and we believe in our ability to help execute on, on the journey, whether it is a capital raise, whether it is, you know, a streamlining of operations or it is an, an exit. So, yes, yeah, success base is probably the way I'd summarise that. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's that's an important note that as as – as we as Fusion 4 Ventures with my Fusion 4 Ventures hat on, um, think about working with clients. We, 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 the, the, the beauty is we've got a lot of demand 
and and it allows us to be very selective on on, on who we work for um a work with is probably a better way to think about it um the what's what's important is that we we like companies that have a track record they've actually demonstrated that they've got a capacity to build a business they have clearly revenues um they, they don't have to be profitable but they need to have clarity on the path to profitability they've got to have done something that's interesting and unique and from our perspective i think valuable um to a potential acquire because we, we we really want to help people realize that dream of, of of exiting a business um and we're very happy to to share in the risk in that journey i mean and, and as you talked about before it's if you're you're selling a business it's about sharing in you know the the, the proceeds from selling of the business but also there's there's a piece of work we're doing at the moment with it with a client around driving revenue growth where we've said well if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to grow at 10 or 20% per annum, okay? But we think you can grow at 30. And what we'll do is we'll work with them hands-on and and share a bit of the upside in the revenue um, above that 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 base rate. The, the whole point is, you know, how do we help a um, small to medium-sized business achieve their true potential? And do it in a way that everyone wins, um, and and it's done in a very efficient, effective, uh, no nonsense manner. And we we try to bring to the party what is I think in the team we worked out almost a hundred years of of uh, prop tech experience um, to to bear on whatever the issue may be, uh, yeah, country agnostic. Um, yeah, we we really don't mind who we work work with as long as they've got a a, a good story, a reasonable business, uh, and so on. That I think is probably the the core area that we're focusing on. Absolutely, and I think the only thing I'd add to that is is again when when you're selling your business as a founder or, or trying to sell your own business, you you often try to pitch what you know is best. This is what's unique about us. This is what's great about our business. Often understanding the motivation of the potential acquirer is key. Uh, and I think typically that gets left to corporate advisors that are you know, private bankers and, and, and just deal makers. Uh, we see ourselves as different. We see ourselves as you know, domain experts and understanding both the acquirer's business and the business of the, of the company that we work with and trying to connect the dots. So again, I'll, I'll use the example of PropTech Group. It became very apparent very quickly to us that what MRI were looking for was market share within Australia and a highly profitable business. So for the moment that that, that realisation came, which came very early on, the way that we presented the business was very different to the way we had initially intended to present the business, which was all about continued growth. So it's really been being agile, then understanding what the acquirer is looking for and ensuring that we have the metrics, the data room, you know, the, the, the due diligence in place to help those companies make those decisions a lot easier and a lot simpler, while the, whilst the founders and the core management team focus on running the day-to-day operations. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you bring up an, an, a very, very excellent point there where a lot of, a lot of um, founders or, or owners who are selling their business are massively in love with it. Yeah. And they they tend to look at it through a certain lens. That, and, and the problem is that, You've got to always put yourself in the shoes of the buyer and present it in in a way that um, looks great. And I, <laughs> the story I keep having, uh, story about the, the way I keep discussing it with with some some of some of the people who are working with at the moment is, you've got this nice little balancing act. You want to present a business that's got you know jetpacks attached to it and going at a million miles an hour, but you don't want to have an earnout attached to it. Right, and sometimes you've got to be a little careful about saying we're going to grow at fifty percent per annum for the next ten years. Fantastic, and the guy acquirer goes great. Um, why don't we attach your earn out to that? No, uh, yeah. So there's a little bit of this art of how to present it, depending on whether it's a straight buy, and someone's just buying it to roll it in, like an MRI did. They didn't. They didn't want an earn out. They just wanted to roll it straight into an existing business that they already had 
in the market and they wanted to say goodbye management, goodbye everyone else, cost savings comes. Well, that's where you're presenting the rocket pack driven business. Um, and then others where you're going to be there for, and we're working with it with, with, with a client at the moment on an earn out. Um, they don't want to present too big a story because they've got hurdles to jump. And if you don't jump the hurdles, then your earn out multiple is less. So there is an art form in, in all of this. Um, Harvey, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, plenty of questions. I, I, I don't come from the non-entrepreneurial background, right? So there's, there's so many things that I, I, I don't understand in terms of, of scaling, and I'd be happy to admit that. I guess one of the things I want to go back to, Joe, is that you said you said something that sort of counterintuitive at the very top of the pod, where you said you've got to stay focused on what you do right. Um, you've got you've got to stay focused on what you do well. But at the same time, you said you've also got to prepare in terms of operational scale, operational efficiencies, things like that. One of the topics I've been thinking about recently is red herrings and sort of distractions. I, I sort of want to get your 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 thoughts and, and maybe some advice for founders who, who want to prepare to, to scale in the next few years. Where do you find that balancing act and how do you know that you're focusing on the right thing at the right time? Um, for a potential acquisition in the future or, or an exit? I mean, that is a really, really good question and a really challenging one to answer because um, as a founder, we, we often find ourselves chasing the next red herring, the next opportunity. I, I think you know, the, the best way for me to answer that question is to have a good advisory board, have good people around you and a clear vision of where you want to get to. And I think it goes back to the point we were making earlier around are you running a business because you love it and you want to do it for the rest of your life and hopefully it'll pay you some dividends? Or do you start thinking about scaling to exit? And if you're at the point of thinking about scaling to exit, then laser focus on that becomes your guiding light, your shining light. So at that point, it's the red herrings, unless they're really, really worth it, don't, it makes it clear that they're not worth chasing. If your core proposition, the core thing that you're trying to sell, and, and I'll, again, I'll use PropTech Group as an example, we had a CRM. We spoke internally. We said our CRM was a Trojan horse. It will let, it will give us really long tenure with our customers, a lot of trust. And once we're in there, we'll start to grow out and add, add additional products and services. But we won't do that until we're at thirty percent market share. So once we got to kind of forty percent market share, our focus shifted from relative market share to number of products per customer. And we were one product per customer until that point. Then we became two, then we became three, and market share was growing at the same time. So I think having a laser focus on where the goalposts are prevent you from chasing you know, those rabbit holes and, and those red herrings. And another question from me is in terms of team size and hiring and firing and maybe restructuring the business, is that something that's going to have to happen as a, an inevitability or is that something that you might all, almost be able to overcome if you, you know, as you say, you've got the right board around you, but I'm wondering if you are trying to grow, grow to exit, you are going to have some inefficiencies in terms of if you're adding new products, you're rolling out new markets, for example, you've got more people coming into the business and are you diluting the value along the way? Uh, yes and no. So the, 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 the short answer is no, because remember one of the key points, unless, as Simon mentioned, you want to sell this business with the view of an earnout, i.e. I believe that I could take this business to where uh, to much faster under your brand, for instance, but I want to be a part of it. But nine times out of 10, typically founders want to sell the business and, and exit. And, and if the an earnout is required, then they'll stay for a year or two to ensure that they hand over the first. Let's assume that to be the case. Then really setting up a framework around you that reduces the reliance on key individuals is the driving force behind why you're hiring, why you're building a network around you. With one of the clients we're working with now, we've got a clear plan that says remove yourself as the key product, key person risk, because you are a big, big part of this business and you want to exit. Uh, and today, if we were to sell this business, you would be locked in for three to five years. So let's spend the next six to 12 months reducing that reliance on you as an individual. And I think that's the key point around why it's necessary to hire people. The other fact is if you're scaling to exit, then remember you're, you're scaling to ensure that you're getting more customers, 
which it often means that you're going to have to hire anyway. So as long as you're not putting yourself too far on the red and you're getting the benefit of that scale, then I think it's a positive. Fair. One final question from me before we before we wrap up. Um, what's the biggest knowledge gap for a founder who 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 wants to 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 go for the to go down this route? Is there anything that you can you know give our listeners today that's going to make them smarter for when they start planning their their strategy to exit tomorrow? It's a good question. I'm interested in Simon's response. Um, look, I think. The biggest knowledge gap is understanding the process. Uh, and, and for me, I think that the number one mistake is always valuation. It, you know, it's understanding, um, having an expectation that, oh, well, I, I think we could sell this business at 10 times revenue multiple because here's some examples. So I, I think the reality is having a clear understanding of the process of actually selling, you know, what, what a company does look at, which is different to raising money. It's similar, but, but different. You know, having a good appreciation of that process, knowing it takes time, uh, is probably the biggest knowledge gap. Unfortunately, there's no quick fix, no quick way of, of doing it. You need to kind of live it uh, to understand it. But, but realistically, the, if I was to give any kind of founder and advice is get realistic over, over valuation. If you truly believe your business is worth the number you have in your head, then proving that through an earnout out is probably likely to be the outcome that you're, you're heading towards. Simon, knowledge gaps? I I think I think Joe's probably hit it, and, and it's actually not even a knowledge gap; it's just an expectation gap. At the end of the day, it's 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 the problem is when you're deeply in love with something, the how you view it and how the rest of the world view it is probably quite different. Okay, and and the rest of the world's going to look through a very practical lens, um, and you're going to look through very rose-coloured glasses. Okay, and and that's when you have this mismatch, and and one of the key key things I do with with all the people I talk to, whether it's a client we're working with Fusion Four Ventures or just even um, general advisory or, or just conversations, is you know if you if I ask them, well, what do you think your business is worth? Well, I think it's worth you know thirty million. I'm going, how? Why? Why? Why did? Why? Well, we're going to do this. This and going great, but you haven't done it. So what's it really worth today? Because you want me to say, if I'm as an investor, they want me to invest. I don't want to invest in the future. I'm investing in today, and I want to benefit in the future. And, I, and I've had too many calls with people where their, their expectations of value or their um, projections are just absolute rubbish. I mean, my, my favorite recently I had, I think I told Joe about this, um, about three, about two or three months ago, was they had this. Um, they, were, they were presenting their business, and it had like uh, two hundred thousand revenues, three hundred thousand revenues. They're raising money at a ridiculously high valuation because next year they're going to do ten million. Yeah, of course. And and I think I even sent it to you. It's the, the the page, and 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 I've gone. This is nuts. I mean, but they were, I, I and I just. What could you do, right? What could you do? You 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 can't say, mm, I'll take that bet, right? Yeah. But why would you give them a cent? Because it's clearly nuts to think you're going to go from in the hundreds of thousands to to the into the the, the high million, the, the, you know, nearly ten million. I think it was nine point eight or something, right? Um, in in literally the space of the year, just because you've raised. One million or two million or whatever it was they were doing a capital raise for it. It just the, the maths just didn't add up, and it was just purely a result of they fell in love with the spreadsheet, and 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 the the ten percent times twenty percent times fifty percent growth suddenly gave them some big number that they then were trying to convince me that was going to happen, and, I, and that's great. So why? I'm, but I'm basically investing in. But I, I kept saying, but I'm basically investing in a was a three or four hundred thousand revenue business, so therefore you're probably worth I don't know one and a half million maybe. If I believe the product, maybe two. So don't try to raise capital from me at ten million valuation. Um, when they kept saying, "Yeah, but next year we're doing you know that, so it'll be worth 50 I'm going, "Yeah, but today you're worth this." Yeah. So the bottom line is, you might be massively in love with your business, but bring it back to reality. Because everyone else you're going to talk to who's either going to buy it from you or invest into you is dealing in the world of reality. And they're the people that I love to work with who aren't dreaming, 
they're just feet firmly on the ground. And I think that's probably the, the, the probably the biggest gap that I see out there. How how do you how do you spot the pragmatists? How do you spot the people who are living in the real world and, and not living in, in cuckoo land as as as, as perhaps ten you'd minute say. conversation. It depends. If it if it's um if it's a presentation, you get it. They're, they're, the pragmatists usually have a very well-structured presentation for their business. They're very clear on the KPIs. They go, this is, these are the five key drivers of the business. This is what we've done against each of them. This is how we're projecting forward. This is our forecast for the business with a bit of variability on, on overperformance, underperformance, and such. They're the ones you start going, okay, this feels good. The other, the other way is in a conversation, and and the ones that I tend to stay away from are the ones who just want to talk at me, right? Because they 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 come from the world of if I talk a lot, you'll say yes. Um, and the ones that um, uh, I prefer to engage with are those who who ask a lot of questions, but the but they're smart questions, right? They're they're questions that show they understand their business. But they they're trying to work out what they don't know, so they can do even better in it. And 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 I guess the best one I ever saw at doing that was a guy called Brian Requeth from um, Viva Real in Brazil. And yeah, he was, you've mentioned him before. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, he's my he's my favorite go to guy for an example because the guy is 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 super smart because he just realized it. there was so much he didn't know. And and he just said, I don't know, so I'm going to ask as many humans as possible until I can work out what I think is the best answer. Then I'll execute it. And that's they're they're the ones that you work out who've got their feet sort of, you know, firmly welded to the ground, but are reaching for the stars. Very poetic, Simon. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> I'm an absolute yeah. poet. <laughs> right, I think that's a good place for us to uh, to uh, wrap up. So. Joe, thanks so much for your time and thanks so much for your uh, transparency in terms of scaling and exiting. I'm sure our listeners will uh, will love it. So, uh, Joe, we'll say goodbye to you. Thank you. Uh, it's That's goodbye from running. Simon Baker. <laughs> and it's goodbye from him. And yeah. it's goodbye <laughs> from me. Goodbye. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>